focus meter. Adjust the focus until the picture is sharp. Now, adjust the level of the sound to a normal volume. Set the tone control for the most pleasing tone. Your show is now ready. It's not surprising that hydrostatic transmissions have been the subject of a great deal of discussion in the farm equipment industry. Because of the desire of every farmer to have an infinite number of transmission speeds, it's no exaggeration to say that hydrostatic introduces a new era in tractor performance. We have at last achieved our objective of providing infinite selection of speed ratios. Now, despite the uh, apparent sophistication of a hydrostatic drive, it's basically a simple matter of applying mechanical and hydraulic principles which have been known for years. Let's examine those principles. Every hydraulic transmission, including hydrostatic, is made up of two basic components. A pump to convert mechanical energy into hydraulic energy, and a hydraulic motor to convert this fluid energy back into mechanical energy. In other words, it takes the rotary energy from the engine, converts it to fluid energy, this motor changes it back into rotary mechanical energy to drive the wheel. There are two basic ways to transmit energy through a fluid. One is by its velocity, or speed with which it moves. A simple illustration is a hose and a water wheel. Other things being equal, the faster the water comes out of the hose, the faster the wheel turns. This principle is used in a torque converter. A hydraulic transmission in which one fan pumps fluid against another fan. Now this is one form of hydrodynamic transmission. The term hydrodynamic meaning fluid in motion. Now hydrodynamic transmissions are useful in many applications. The uh, problem comes when you apply a continuous heavy load, as in farm tractors. You can see that when a heavy resistance is applied to the wheel, much of the fluid energy is wasted. This is an exaggeration, of course, because the pump and motor would be enclosed. But even so, with a continuous heavy load, a relatively high degree of slippage is unavoidable. Thus, as far as farm tractors are concerned, the hydrodynamic or velocity method is too inefficient. The other method is the positive displacement approach. This is the method used in the hydrostatic transmission. In terms of basic principles, this approach has uh, some very significant advantages. To begin with, the simplest, most positive way to displace the fluid is with a cylinder and piston, as in a piston-type pump. Now, what's more, if we add a second piston to the system to react to the first, 
we have in effect a pump and a motor. Now notice that the very same components serve as a pump when exerting pressure and as a motor when reacting to it. Let's take a closer look. Now, if the pump displaces a certain amount of fluid, the motor must react by accepting the same amount of fluid. Now, assuming a close fit between the pistons and the cylinder wall, the force of the pump is transmitted positively and directly to the motor, almost as if this were a solid rod. This positive displacement approach makes ideal use of a unique quality of all fluids. The fact that a fluid is virtually incompressible. Its volume can't be changed. In this respect, therefore, it acts almost as if it were a solid. Now, why don't we use a solid? Well, maybe this uh, model will demonstrate. A fluid can go around corners. Positive, direct. No problems of slippage, as with vanes or turbines. Just a few reasons why the piston and cylinder method is used to transmit fluid energy and brakes, lifts, steering, and so many other applications. Essentially, the same piston-type pump is at the heart of the whole system. Let's look at an actual pump from a hydrostatic transmission. Instead of one piston and cylinder, the actual pump, of course, has a total of nine. Now, the ends of each one of these pistons is held against a flat plate. I uh, think this plastic model might give us a clearer picture. Here are the ends of the pistons up against the flat plate. Now this is a smooth, hard surface known as the swash plate. What causes the pistons to reciprocate? Very interesting feature. The swash plate tilts at various angles. Now when the rotary motion is applied, the pistons pump in and out. With fluid in the system, you can see that as the pistons move out of the block, they accept fluid. And as they uh, push into the block, they force out or displace fluid. With the nine pistons reciprocating at the same time, their strokes are constantly overlapping. The effect is positive displacement that is virtually constant. That basically is all there is to the pump and the hydrostatic transmission. Let's uh, take a look at the motor. Except for the size, the motor is a copy of the pump. It has the same nine pistons. And once again, the ends of each of these pistons is held against the stationary swash plate. In fact, the best way to describe the motor is that it is a pump, only in reverse. Now, how do the pump and motor work together in the system? The principle is the same as this pump and motor illustration of a moment ago, using the two pistons and the cylinder with the fluid in between. What causes the motor block to rotate? Once again, the basic principle is simplicity itself. For the sake of demonstration, we'll use just two pistons and consider that the motor is on a vertical axis instead of horizontal. It works exactly the same, but it's easy to see. This block represents the stationary swash plate. As a flat surface on an angle, it uh, looks like an inclined plane, which is exactly the function it performs. We'll let this rod and the pressure of my hand represent the hydraulic force delivered by the pump. Watch what happens when we apply this force to the piston. The piston sliding down the inclined plane causes the motor block to rotate. It's as simple as that. The motor in the hydrostatic transmission works in exactly the same way, horizontally instead of vertically. But still, it's the force of the pistons pushing on the inclined plane that causes the motor block to rotate. Since the pump and motor function as separate units, we need some means of conducting the flow of oil between the two. That's where the stationary center section comes in. It provides a simple means of bringing this flow of oil to the motor. Let's look at the actual components. This is the stationary center section. It's mounted on this board for demonstration purposes. The pump, the motor. 
As the pump rotates, these openings from the nine cylinders in the pump line up with this curved opening in the center section. The oil pressure is directed from the pump pistons through this stationary center section to these openings in the motor. Forcing the pistons in the motor against the stationary swash plate, causing the motor to rotate. In effect, the oil is forced through this side and returns through the opposite side. I think it's about time we uh, took a look at an actual hydrostatic tractor transmission. The uh, top's been cut away so you can see the working parts. Now here's the pump from the ends of the pistons to that string of openings. Here's the stationary center section. Since the top's been cut away, you can see how the oil flows through that curved opening to the motor. And here's the motor. These uh, two massive hunks of metal on either end are the swash plates. Tiltable. A positive displacement pump to convert mechanical rotary energy from the engine into hydraulic energy through the center section to the motor, which converts this fluid energy back into rotary mechanical energy to drive the wheels. If we wanted the system to operate at one constant speed, that's uh, about all we'd need. But we wouldn't be accomplishing our basic objective of providing infinite speed ratios. Now the next question is how to vary the speed ratio. Simply by varying the gallons per minute capacity. There are two ways to vary capacity. One is to change the speed of rotation, which results in more or less piston strokes in the same amount of time. The second way to vary capacity is to change the length of the piston stroke. The hydrostatic transmission utilizes both these variables to provide the desired control. First at the pump. Now since the pump is driven by the engine and we want the engine speed to remain constant for maximum horsepower output, pump output is varied by changing the length of stroke. How? Simply by varying the angle of the swash plate. Now at this angle, the pistons have a relatively short distance to travel. When the angle is increased, you can see that each piston stroke is longer, automatically increasing the output. Each of the nine pistons stroke out farther, accepting more oil, and they push back farther, displacing more oil. The motor, in turn, has to accept these additional gallons of output. Its capacity must increase to match the output of the pump. In this case, though, it takes advantage of the other method of varying capacity. And that, of course, is by rotating faster. Let's start up the engine and bring the pump swash plate to a vertical position. You see what happens? There's no piston stroke and no pump output, so the motor stops. To make it still easier, the linkage between the speed ratio control and the swash plate is not mechanical, but hydraulic through servo cylinders. The servo cylinder on the left controls the angle of the pump swash plate. The servo cylinder on the right controls the angle of the motor swash plate. You see, there is a practical limit of just how far you can tilt the swash plate. And as the pump swash plate reaches its maximum angle, and as you continue moving the speed ratio control forward, the servo cylinders automatically begin decreasing the angle of the motor swash plate. And as this angle is decreased, the motor is forced to turn faster. The result in this particular application is a forward speed range of up to 20 miles an hour. Another refinement made possible by the characteristics of this system is the unique method of lubrication, hydrostatic lubrication. And it's uh, based on the fact that as the load increases, so does the lubrication. Now here's how we use it, and we'll use this part as an example. The slipper, which is attached to the end of each of the pistons with a ball and socket. The purpose, of course, is to provide a smooth, flush contact with the swash plate, no matter how the angle is buried. A drilled port through the piston and slipper allows a metered amount of oil to be forced through the opening. 
to form a thin cushion of oil between the slipper and swash plate. This cushion of oil cannot be squeezed out, simply because as the workload increases, so does the lubrication pressure. That's hydrostatic lubrication. Automatically self-compensating. And basically that's the way it works throughout the entire system. Other refinements designed into the system include automatic braking from engine compression. You're always in gear, so to speak, even when holding back a heavy load downhill. There's no danger of freewheeling. The speed ratio control also has its built-in safety features. In addition to zero forward and zero reverse positions, if you release the lever while stopped, it automatically centers itself into a true neutral. Neutral not only prevents creeping, but also makes possible a conventional brake system that requires no special care or training for the operator. The foot and inch control performs three safety functions. It must be depressed to disengage the transmission before the engine will start. It makes it easy to maneuver in close quarters. And to take care of natural reactions in case of an emergency, it gives you another way to stop in a hurry. Adding still greater sophistication or automation to the system, various other valving and fluid bypass arrangements protect both operator and equipment. One, for instance, provides a safe limit to the rate of acceleration. No matter how quickly the operator shoves the lever to fast forward, the servo cylinders automatically control the rate at which they change swatch plate angles. To prevent problems from panic reactions, even if the lever is pulled straight back to zero, you get a safely controlled stop. And if, during a quick stop, the operator depresses the foot and inch control, there's no freewheeling problem, as you might expect. The tractor simply will not freewheel at a ground speed faster than called for by the SR control setting. It's completely automatic. And these are just a few illustrations. Extra advantages of performance and operating characteristics. All typical of the almost unlimited opportunity for refinement and sophistication in hydrostatics, and all in addition to obtaining our original objective, that of providing an infinite selection of speed ratios. Full power at all time, quick and ready control of ground speed. It's no wonder that few developments in the history of power for agriculture offer such great potential for serving the farmer so well in so many ways. Thank you.